There seems to be conflicting information out there about whether or not it's appropriate to use hyperbaric oxygen to help somebody fight infections. So in this video, we are going to discuss whether or not it is appropriate, or when is it appropriate, to use hyperbaric oxygen for infection. Welcome to video two on the series of mechanisms of action. Last video, we did a quick introduction of the concept of trying to get away from using protocols for conditions only as our method of applying hyperbaric oxygen, understanding that hyperbaric has so much more to offer. And the better we understand all of hyperbaric oxygen's mechanisms of action, the more effectively we will be able to apply this therapy for a much broader range of people with much more effective protocols. In that same video, we talked about that there are 12 mechanisms of action that we discuss in great detail in our 40-hour certification course, but that ultimately of those 12, we can break them down into four categories, an antimicrobial category, an immunological or immune modulating category, a mitochondrial or cellular energy category, and then a regenerative repair category. So we're going to be talking today about the antimicrobial effect of hyperbaric oxygen. And ultimately, we do use hyperbaric oxygen on label, in other words, FDA approved, as a tool to help patients with very specific infections. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about what those infections are. From that, we're going to start to pull why is it appropriate to use hyperbaric oxygen for those infections. None of that is controversial. It is well documented. It is FDA approved. There is nothing in that conversation that is controversial or without a mountain of evidence. We're then going to take those concepts and really map out which mechanisms of action are at play here so that we can understand what's going on inside a patient's body. And then we can take those concepts and then look at similar but potentially not on-label, so off-label indications. Why or how should we apply hyperbaric oxygen for these off-label indications in a very thoughtful way? And how do we start building out the framework for what a treatment plan would look like in those cases? So it is absolutely non-controversial and well-documented that we use hyperbaric oxygen on-label in clinics, in hospitals for certain conditions like gas gangrene, necrotizing fasciitis, certain cerebral abscesses, and osteomyelitis, specifically recurrent osteomyelitis, where the traditional antibiotic route isn't working. In fact, all of those cases are sort of a last attempt at trying to help a patient who's dealing with those infections to use hyperbaric oxygen as really the patient's last resort. For gas gangrene, in many cases, we use it only to help demarcate where the healthy tissue and the dead tissue is to potentially reduce how aggressive the amputation might be. With necrotizing fasciitis, we use it after the series of typical antibiotics aren't working properly. With crane intracranial abscesses, we're using hyperbaric where surgeries are contraindicated. And again, osteomyelitis, we're using it again where the typical course of antibiotics just don't seem to be working. So we have these patients that have very severe infections. We do the standard of care, and if they're not responding, we then look to hyperbaric oxygen to try to come in and help shift that immune response. And in many cases, it's very successful, even at that late stage. And so why is it effective? What is hyperbaric doing, even as a last case scenario for so many of those patients, that makes it so meaningful? Of the list of 12 mechanisms of action that we talk about in class, a few come to mind. One is toxin inhibition. So most of these infections release pretty severe toxins that destroy tissue. And as we create an environment that doesn't allow that bacteria to, or infection to thrive, we're able to suppress how much toxin that those microbes are able to release into our system. So we can create toxin inhibition. Next, there's antibiotic synergy. So again, most of these people are already on a very intense antibiotic regimen. And for a number of reasons, whether it's antibiotic-resistant microorganisms or their anaerobic infections living underneath biofilms, when we combine hyperbaric with traditional medicine, so hyperbaric plus antibiotics, there's a great synergy that takes place that really shifts that person's immune system and helps them fight that infection much more effectively. And then lastly, we know that the majority of these infections are anaerobic. What does that mean? It means these infections live and thrive in a low or no oxygen environment. 
And so what is hyperbaric doing? Obviously, it's creating hyperoxygenation. So it's driving oxygen levels internally very, very high and creating an environment where those microorganisms just cannot thrive. They cannot live. So by shifting the environment to a high oxygen environment where anaerobes cannot function, by creating synergy with antibiotics, by helping to break down those biofilms, and by helping to suppress the toxins that these microorganisms release, we can really shift the direction that a patient is going when they're fighting these horrifically severe, often either life-threatening or limb-threatening conditions. So now that we understand that, we understand the shifting of the environment, we understand the biofilm breakdown, the synergy with other antimicrobial substances and the toxin inhibition, we could start looking at, are there other infections that maybe are not necessarily life or limb threatening, but certainly quality of life destroying? And can we apply a similar therapy to create a similar effect inside that patient's body, helping them fight those infections? My opinion, of course, the answer is yes. We are on a mission to make sure that the people looking for this information have access to it. I know that there's a lot of content out there, and I know that it could be very confusing when people are trying to find the answers that they're looking for, and it's really important for me that those people can find these answers. So when you like it, when you subscribe, and when you share these videos, that helps the people looking for this content know that they're getting a trustworthy source and they're getting the information that they're trying to find. So please do that and help us help other people. Certain infections like H. pylori, C. diff, Lyme, Candida, and other mold species, these are also all anaerobic infections. They're chronic in nature. They typically have some level of antibiotic or traditional treatment resistance. And the majority of them also either live in a low or no oxygen environment, covered by biofilms or the safety of a spore form, which is also a low or no oxygen environment. And so does it now make sense that we can take a therapy that we know shifts four different areas of that environment and use it as part of a strategy for helping a patient also fight these hyperbaric off-label infections in a similar way. However, now we have to think, well, what is the protocol that's traditionally used for these very severe infections? Well, it's typically very high pressure, over two atmospheres, usually two to 2.4, sometimes 2.6 or even 2.8. PO2, meaning the atmospheric pressure, let's say 2.4 at 100% oxygen would be a PO2 of 2.4. Or at 2.8 ATA on 100% oxygen would be a PO2 of 2.8. So we use these very, very high pressures of oxygen in these very severe life-threatening, limb-threatening conditions. We discussed that these are not necessarily limb and life-threatening. They're just quality of life destroying. So perhaps we don't necessarily need as much pressure, or we could look at it like this, we don't necessarily need to apply as intensive of a therapy for a less severe condition. These infections are also acute, meaning they're relatively new and have a rapid onset and growth. This category is typically persistent and chronic. So whereas this might have a series of treatments, get the best out of it, and then stop the treatment either as the patient is responding or if unfortunately the patient isn't responding, this therapy really needs to be looked at more long-term. It's chronic in nature. The patient's issues are five years, 10 years, sometimes 20 years in the making. They're going to need a longer series of sessions. So this category is likely to be able to use lower pressure for a longer period of time, whereas this category is gonna require much higher pressure and likely for a shorter period of time. I believe as we look through this category of off-label infection control, we can also just view what pressures of oxygen we need also through the same lens of severity and intensity. There's some research to support, let's say in an acute Lyme case, that high pressure is also suitable. That in order to really kill a spirochete with pressures of oxygen, 2.6 or 2.8 ATA is actually very likely to be the case. Yet when we're dealing with chronic Lyme, it's a very different story. And also when we're dealing with chronic Lyme, we're also dealing with tissue destruction, chronic inflammation, immune system imbalance. And so again, we can use lower pressures over longer periods of time. So again, there's not a protocol for Lyme. How long have you had it? Where did it affect you? Was it neurological? Was it systemic? Was it mostly musculoskeletal? Is this a one-year issue or a one-week issue? Or is it a 10-year issue? All of these would play a role in what the atmospheric pressure percentage of oxygen, and then frequency and duration would need to look like for these infection cases.
There's great research to show that at mid-ranges of pressures of oxygen, that we can slow candida growth up to 50% within two or three sessions. Again, using that toxin inhibition mechanism. We already discussed in this on-label category that it helps to break down those biofilms. Well, it's also gonna help break down those biofilms in these off-label conditions as well. So when dealing with these off-label conditions, we can be talking about mild pressures, 1.3, 1.5, all the way up to 1.75 or even 2.0. In rare cases for these off-label conditions, we may go above 2.0. But again, please look at this much more as the lower the pressure we use, the more frequency and duration we're likely going to need in order to achieve the results that we're looking for. The more severe the infection is, the more damage the infection is doing, the more pressure we should consider using. If it's Lyme or Candida, but the main symptoms are neurological, I'm not gonna go to higher pressure. I'm gonna stay at that 1.3 to 1.75 max, likely to be between 1.3 and 1.5 because we know that neurologic issues and neurologic inflammation seems to be very responsive to that mild to mid ranges of pressure. So again, this isn't to give you the protocol for each of those infections. It's to give you a thought process to go through. And I hope that this was helpful. Understanding how to take an on-label concept, how to pull those mechanisms of action, how to really understand what those mechanisms are, how to apply that to an off-label case. Along these same lines, a question that we do get is, aren't there some infections that actually feed on oxygen? And so is it or is it not appropriate to use hyperbaric? The answer to this is a little bit more complex. I've seen no studies to support or refute either side of that conversation. So for this, I'm really just commenting on clinical experience. And what I would say is we've treated dozens and dozens and dozens of patients with Lyme, co-infections, and some that have been said to feed on oxygen. And I have not yet once seen where hyperbaric oxygen in those cases made it worse. And what I'll add to that is while we're talking about in this video, the antimicrobial effect of oxygen and that most of these infections are anaerobic, therefore high oxygen environment makes a lot of sense. The argument here is that, well, in a high oxygen environment, we're feeding those other bacteria. Maybe they're gonna do well. Well, in the next video, we're gonna talk about how hyperbaric affects the immune system. And one of the major effects of the immune system is it increases our immune system's capacity to fight infection. And so what I believe we're seeing in the clinic is that while we may be feeding some of those aerobes a little bit, we're also massively improving our immune system's function and our immune system's ability to fight the infection, in which case we consistently see, whether it's Lyme and or Lyme with co-infections, that these patients are responding well, they're improving, even though they have certain co-infections that may be more aerobic in nature. So we would continue to work with those patients regardless. We'll see you next time. And on the next video, we're gonna be talking about the other immunological effects of hyperbaric being reducing inflammation and increasing our own white blood cells capacity to fight infection itself. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe so that you catch the next few episodes as we go through mechanisms two, three, and four in this series. So whether you're a chiropractor or a naturopath or an acupuncturist or a DO or even an MD, but you're looking at hyperbarics through this lens, the lens that I'm describing, which is applying hyperbarics for all these off-label conditions, this is the class that teaches that. And right now it's the only class that teaches this type of hyperbarics in this way, and that's an actual certification course. Check out hbotusa.com, and uh, right across the, the top, you'll see upcoming events. You can click on that, and it'll show you uh, when our next courses are gonna be.